What if? What if you had one year left to live? What would you do? How would you spend that time? We haven't had a chance to meet each other. I wouldn't pretend to know exactly what you would do. But I can tell you that 10 years ago, at 23 years old, I had to face that question. And in the time since then, I've been privileged to meet many other people who have faced it as well. Some of them are still with us. Some of them aren't. And even though we came from different backgrounds, from different parts of the country, we had different reasons for why we might be facing the end of our lives, we all shared one thing in common. And that is when we found out we may not have a lot of time left to live, we started to live differently. We stopped worrying so much about what the world said was reasonable, logical, important, and started to focus on what we knew in our heart really mattered. And when we started to live passionately, life became a richer, fuller, better experience. And so today I want to share with you some lessons that I learned while I was dying. Someone once said, there's nothing quite like dying to teach you how to live. And in that year, I learned more about life than I had in the 22 years before that. I will share with you before those lessons a little bit of the story. It's very important to me, however, that you know why I do that. I don't share the story so that you think I'm special, I'm different, so that you admire me or feel sorry for me because I'm exactly like everybody in this room. We've heard some amazing stories already today. We will hear some more this afternoon. And so I share my story not to say, hey, look at me, but only so that you hopefully see your challenges and my challenges, so that you see where the lessons I'll share with you later come from. Because they don't come from books that I've read or studies that I've done, not that there's anything wrong with those things, but they come from lessons that I've lived. And so I know that they're real and I know that they can make an impact in your life. So I want you to imagine, if you can, as university students, you certainly can imagine what it would be like. 23 years old, about to embark on my second degree in education to become a teacher. And I notice over the course of the semester that something just isn't right. The hill on the university campus that I climb every day seems to be getting steeper and steeper. I start to get out of breath more easily. My hands and my feet are swelling for no real reason. I'm losing weight, not eating right. I know I'm sick, but I'm busy. I'm a university student. I have things to do. So I ignore all of those symptoms. I come home at the end of a school year, knock on the door to my parents' house. My mom opens the door, and her face turns white. Her jaw drops. And she says, Mark, you look horrible. And I say, thanks a lot, Mom. I haven't seen you in three months. That's a nice way to say hi. And she said, well, you've lost a lot of weight. You look really sick. What's wrong? I said, stress from exams. I don't, I'm, don't worry about it. I'm fine. She took me to see my family doctor, who took one look at me and admitted me to hospital. A week later, I was on an ambulance to see a cardiac transplant team. I'd been followed by this team for a number of years because I was born with a heart problem, and we knew heart transplantation was something that was maybe in the future. And all through the years before this day, everything was different. The doctor was casual. We would talk about school and life and lots of you know, current events before we ever talked about my illness. This day was different. He came in. He had my file in his hand. He looked me in the eye and said the words that changed my life forever. Mark, you need a heart and double lung transplant. I said, OK. When? Two years? Three years? Five years? He said, I can't make any promises. I don't know for sure. But if I had to guess, I would say, if you don't have a transplant in the next 24 months, you won't see your 25th birthday. Just like that, everything in life changes. Over the course of the next year, I was in and out of hospitals with tests and evaluations. I was accepted on the transplant list in Toronto. In October of 2001, my dad and I left my family my mom and three brothers who were home in the Maritimes and moved to Toronto to start waiting for a transplant. I waited for four months outside of the hospital with a pager by my side every day, waiting for it to go off to tell me I had new organs. After four months, the condition got worse and I was admitted to hospital. 
There I lived for six more months, each night going to bed wondering if I would wake up in the morning. Each morning waking up wondering would this be the day the call would come. Finally, September the 6th, 2002, 10.15 at night, a nurse appears at my door. Mark, there's a call for you at the nurse's station. I walked down the hall, picked up the phone, and a lady on the other end said, Mr. Black, I think we have a set of heart and lungs for you. And there's this long pause while I try and think of what the appropriate response to that statement is. <laughs> Thank you, I think I said, I really don't remember. A few hours of preparation and phone calls pass. My mom arrives. We hug, we cry, we pray together for a little while. We fell asleep waiting for the doctors to come. And at 5.15, they show up at the door and say, OK, time to go. And I look at my mom, and my mom looks at me, both of us searching for the right words to say, knowing this could be the last time we'll ever get to talk. And all I could think to say to mom was, mom, I'm going to see you soon, because I didn't want to talk about what might go wrong. I was in surgery for seven hours in the ICU for five days, was blessed to be discharged from hospital 16 days after the surgery. And since then, I've been able to do some things that 10 years ago would have been impossible. And as much as the life that I've lived since the transplant has been wonderful, the greatest gift was that year and the lessons that I learned from it. And those are the things that I want to share with you today. The first one is something you've probably heard in some form or another millions of times before. Choose to focus on positives. But when I use those words, when I say that that way, it's for a very specific reason. I chose those words carefully. I don't say, be happy. I don't say, have a great attitude. I don't say, you know, be, have a smile on your face all the time, even though those things are great. But I don't think they're fair. Because I think some of us are naturally perky, happy, positive people. That's just who we are. And, you know, you're the kind of person who gets up for class on a Monday morning in a snowstorm, and you're still really happy to be there. <laughs> and if you're one of those people, God bless you, just stay away from the rest of us until we've had coffee. If that's you, that's great. If that's not you, that's great too. When I say choose to focus on positives, I don't mean to pretend to be happy when you're not. What I do mean is to challenge you to realize that each and every day, dozens and dozens of times, we're making choices, most of them subconscious, about how we're going to interpret the events of our lives. And the quality of your life will largely be shaped by the quality of the interpretation. What I realized in going through my transplant experience, being stuck in a hospital as a young, active university student. I mean, I went from being involved in 23 activities and a full-time student and a part-time job to sitting in a hospital bed doing nothing. And it was really hard. But what it taught me eventually was that I could focus on what had been taken away, I could focus on what I'd lost, or I could focus on what I had to be thankful for. And as I realized that, I realized that in any situation, there were lots of things to be positive about. In that situation, I lived in a country where I was being given a second chance. In many countries around the world, with my situation, they would have said, sorry, nothing we can do. I didn't go a single day in six months without a family member or a friend beside me every single day to support me and keep my mood up. Lots of people were in that hospital doing really difficult things, just like I was, except they were doing it alone. And so I can look back now, 10 years later, and tell you there were amazing opportunities that have come as a direct result of that obstacle in my life. And so I would challenge you to think about what it is you focus on each day. Because I believe we go through life with these two buckets. We've got this bucket full of good stuff, this bucket full of bad stuff. Which bucket are you going to pull from every day? That will be what determines the quality of your life. Choose to focus on positives. The second lesson doesn't immediately make a lot of sense. Live today. Well, what other day is there, right? Except how many times have you had a bad Monday and let it ruin Tuesday? How many times as university students have you stressed for days, weeks, and months about something like, I don't know, midterms, exams, something like that maybe? <laughs> many of us will waste large chunks of our lives, not live them, but waste them on things we have absolutely no control over at all. We're either trying to fix yesterday, which is done and over, and we can't go back, 
or we're worried about something that may happen tomorrow that we have no control over at all. The reason I spent six months in the hospital is because my heart had developed a rhythm abnormality and I was at risk for something called sudden cardiac death where your heart races and races and races and then it stops. Doctors explained it could stop at any moment. I could literally die at any moment. Something to worry about? You bet. And for weeks I did. And then one day I clued in that I worried all day yesterday and I was still here. But now yesterday was gone and I couldn't get it back. And so I promised myself that day that I wasn't going to let another moment go by wasting it on things I had no control over. The second part of live today goes from the past to the future. And that is don't wait for some magic day to start living the life you want to live. So many of us, especially in the, in the age of university age where we're trying to figure out the rest of our life, we make that mistake of saying, well, when I do this or when I do that, when I reach X milestone, I'll start living. When I graduate or when I get married or when the kids leave the house, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And then for so many people, that magic someday when everything is going to align never happens. Don't be one of those people whose gravestone one day says, here lies someone who was about to do a lot of really good stuff. <laughs> live this day as best as you can. Now, people who have gone through things like me will say, live every day like it's your last day. Don't do that. I don't want to drive on the highway with a bunch of people that are living today like it's the last day. <laughs> okay, don't live every day like it's your last day. Just live every day. Be alive every day. Take time every day to make sure the people that you love know that you love them. If you live every day as best as you can, tomorrow starts to take care of itself. The third lesson comes from my dad. My dad was a gym teacher and a coach and a father. And he would always tell us, boys, go big or stay home. In other words, you get one shot at this thing called life. You get to go around this world one time. You don't do yourself or anybody else any favors by doing it small. You know, I think as Canadians, we have this inferiority complex. We have this complex. We have this, with this humility that says, well, we're not supposed to, you know, we have to, we don't want to be loud and obnoxious and like those other people <laughs> who will remain nameless. Okay, and there's nothing wrong with being, humil being humble. Humility is a great quality and we should be humble. But you can also dare to dream big dreams at the same time. Dare to push yourself to see what you can accomplish. To me, one of the saddest things in the world is not when people die young, it's when people die old, but they only live the first 15 or 20 years of their life. And then they lived another 60 or 70, living the same day over and over and over and over again. And somewhere along the way, they forgot that they were alive. Dare to dream big dreams. Dare to push yourself to see what you're really capable of. Most of us will have no clue of what we can really do because we're so afraid of failure, we're so afraid of someone else's judgment, it's easier to just not try. It's easier to just blend in and be average. That would be okay, except that nobody here is average. Everybody in this room was born where they were to who they were with the unique com complex of skills and abilities that you have for a reason, I think. Your job is to figure out what that reason is and go out and use it to serve the world. Dare to dream big dreams. And I want to give you a little example. I decided uh, shortly after my transplant that I wanted to run a marathon. And the reason simply being I couldn't think of anything else that would better demonstrate to myself and to others that anything was possible. I couldn't climb a flight of stairs before the transplant, so I thought if I can run a marathon, I can do anything. And the day I decided to run the transplant was seven days after, or run the marathon was seven days after the transplant. And I could explain how I was feeling and the condition I was in, but a picture does it better, and so I'll show you. Now, this isn't a pretty picture, seven days after a major transplant surgery, but it explains it much better than I can, and so I, I want to show you what you're looking at. I have about 40 surgical staples that go across the chest from one side to the other. Five chest tubes go into the sides to drain fluid from the abdominal cavity. I weigh about 80 pounds, legs swollen with fluid. Decide that day to run a marathon. Crazy? Maybe. But I thought, if I can do that, then I can do anything. Now, did I get out of bed the next day and do it? Of course not. It took weeks to walk on the treadmill. It took months to jog for the first time. It took two and a half years from that day to realize the dream of crossing the finish line. 
And I show you those pictures and I tell you that story not so that you say, well, look what Mark did. Totally not the point. The point is to say, if he can do that, what can I do? That's what going big is all about. Lesson number four. I am alive today because somebody gave the greatest gift that somebody can give. Because someone made a selfless act in a time of absolute tragedy in their life, in the life of their family, gave organs to someone they didn't know, and I stand here today because of that gift. To me, there is no greater action you can make, there is no greater achievement you can have than to give of yourself to the world to make it a better place. And so I would challenge you to think of ways that you can give. And they can be big, but they can be small. Mother Teresa said the greatest gift we can ever give is a smile to someone we don't know. She probably said it more eloquently than that. But basically, make those little actions every day. Make that little gift every day of yourself to make little differences in other people's lives. And cumulatively, they make a big difference in the world. Give as much as you can. And the last lesson is probably the most important, and that's why I save it for the end, because I hope if you remember nothing else, you'll take this home with you. When I was listed for transplant, the doctors sat down with my family and I, and they wanted to tell us about the risks of the procedure. And they said, Mark, uh, you need a heart and double lung transplant. It's the riskiest, most dangerous surgery we do. Five-year survival rate, 50%. They went on and on and on explaining the risks pre, during, and post-surgery the risks of the medication, the long-term side effects, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of this long conversation, they'd given me a whole list of reasons why I'm not supposed to be here. And here I stand. And so if you take away nothing else from what I've said today, I hope that you remember that. That no matter how dark things get, no matter how hopeless things seem, no matter how frustrated you may be, no matter how much it may seem sometime like there's no light at the end of that tunnel, never, ever, ever give up. Because if you will refuse to quit, you cannot fail. I believe nobody in the history of the world has ever failed at anything. And you'll say, Mark, lots of people didn't succeed. And I'll say, yeah, lots of people didn't succeed, but they didn't fail. They just gave up before they got where they wanted to go. Sometimes people are surprised when you talk about running a marathon. I say running a marathon is easy. You put one foot in front of the other until you get there. It's that simple. And it's a great metaphor for our lives. You put one foot in front of the other until you get there. So I want to leave you with this last thought. Uh, it, it was a wise man who once said, we, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. And so I want to challenge you to take everything that you've learned today, everything you hear for the rest of the day, and go out and give it to the community and to the world. Thanks, everybody. God bless. Take care. <laughs>